Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Maggie Fox, consulting editor for Medscape and WebMD. Today, we're chatting with Dr. Walter Koroshetz, director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, one of the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Koroshetz, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure, Maggie. Thank you. Long COVID is going to be with us for a long time, and it's affecting millions. The latest estimate from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention suggests at least 14% of all U.S. adults have had long COVID or still have it. Research into what's causing it and how to treat it is getting underway, but it will take years to get good, solid answers. Dr. Koroshetz, can you tell us what's going on with clinical trials for long COVID? Uh, what's going on now in terms of clinical trials is is kind of, I would say, people trying to take multiple shots on goal, not really knowing what, what the underlying uh, uh, trouble is. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's totally appropriate. You, you want to, you know, just see if you can get lucky. Um, usually people are trying nutraceuticals, people are trying uh, uh, approved medications for other conditions. Um, mostly pretty small trials right now, trying to see if there's any kind of a signal, uh, but there are hundreds going on around the world uh, right now. Um, at NIH, what we've done is to build um, a, a real, um, boy, you would, you'd almost say invasion force um, to, to try and attack this problem uh, called the Recover Initiative. And there, what we're doing is looking at every single possibility that we can think of that could be the cause of the trouble. And then, uh, and then with that information, we think we can really inform some kind of what we call, you know, rational, scientific rational clinical trials going forward. And so we're in that stage right now of uh, collecting lots of data from 10, over 10,000 people the largest in-person study of, of, of uh, long COVID in the world, uh, collecting samples, analyzing samples, trying to get hints uh, as to what the underlying cause is, um, and then designing trials kind of based on what, what we can find. I know it's impossible to predict the outcome of trials, but what can physicians do in the meantime to help their patients? Well, um, the symptoms of long COVID are usually come in clusters. And uh, there are some that are really high on the list, like fatigue, for instance, is extremely common. Um, and uh, sometimes that's associated with trouble with sleeping. Uh, insomnia, trouble, sleep disorders have been seen in the people with long COVID. So one avenue, you know, just a, an, as an example would be to try and use medications or behavioral treatments to improve someone's sleep because certainly sleeplessness is going to contribute to the fatigue. So the point there is that currently the, the treatments that people are using are, are basically symptomatic based and they are, so they're, they're treatments that have been used in other conditions like insomnia, for instance, uh, and then brought into treating people with, with long COVID. Um, so that um, uh, none of them really are, are focused on getting at the underlying cause at this point in time. In the meantime, patients are often finding or being offered unproven treatments like supplements, dry salt therapy, hyperbaric oxygen. How dangerous is this? Well, it all depends on what the treatment is. Yeah. So there are trials going on of, of you know, um, nutraceuticals of different types, uh, coenzyme Q10, vitamin, high vitamin supplementation. Um, and some of these are, you know, although unproven, they have very low safety problems. Hyperbaric oxygen is a little bit different for sure, uh, depending on the, the dose of oxygen you get, there are, you know, some serious problems you could get into. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that you know, like everything else in this country, you know, people have the right to try things, um, but it's really up to their physicians to, you know, to really, you know, consult with them, particularly to prevent them from something that's not going to be safe. Um, because at this point in time, given our knowledge, 
uh, the chance that they're going to run into a highly efficacious treatment is probably pretty low. Well, that's because there's a reason for clinical trials, right? Even though you might think something works, unless you try it in a number of people, you're never going to be able to know for sure that it works. Right. There's so much variability that the, per, the, the, the rationale behind a clinical trial is that you randomize people to two groups, one that gets the active treatment, one that gets a placebo, and you can't tell the difference. And, um, and that's because if you just follow people with this condition, there's going to be some people get better, some people get worse. And that's what's called the noise. To see, to see something that's efficacious, it has to have an effect size that goes above the noise. And that's why you need these clinical trials. And that's an important point to make because you get a lot of noise. And of course, a lot of physicians really believe in the treatments they're using. They really want to help their patients. They believe the treatment's going to work. The patients believe the treatment's going to work. But that doesn't necessarily mean it is the treatment that's working. Right. Well, again, I would go back to the point where the symptoms that are occurring in long COVID are not, there's nothing brand new about them. They They've all been around forever. So doctors are always trying to help people who have these symptoms from lots of other conditions. That's one thing about long COVID. If you just do a cross-sectional analysis of people and you might get, you know, 35% of people after COVID have, you know, three or four symptoms that you see in long COVID. But you will also find 15 or 20% of people who never had COVID will have the same symptoms. You've talked about the clinical trials going on at NIH. Informal physician networks are also getting started, like the Long COVID Research Consortium. That's a collaboration of researchers at Harvard, Stanford, the University of California, San Francisco, Johns Hopkins, Yale, a bunch of places. Is this kind of thing helpful? Does this add to the body of research that you can pull from? Oh, yes. Actually, we're funding many of those people. <laughs> so we have in the recover, we have, you know, we have, you know, hundreds of sites across the country and all the ones you named are in the program. So yeah, so I think that you know everyone's thinking of how to how to do better for these patients now. Um, so yeah, I mean it's a great thing for people to to really engage on this and focus on it. And then what we have in Recover is people can come in with their ideas. We have committees that look at each of the ideas and prioritize them for what goes into clinical trials next. Um, the one we're working on now is what's called an antiviral trial. Um, so people. Uh, may know, you know, it's still not definitive, but there's some suggestions that the viruses may still be hiding in some places in the body, and that might be what's causing trouble in some folks. And so the question there is, would an antiviral agent be able to eradicate the virus and make, you know, pe people's symptoms go away? Um, so we, we are working hard on that kind of a trial. We'd love you know, for that to work, we'd really like to have some kind of a readout that, you know, the medicine we're giving really is knocking out the virus. And that's where we're having trouble at this point in time, because it's, uh, you know, it's, it, no one's actually been able to actually see the virus in anything that is, uh, that's accessible in the living person. Um, most of the, the studies that are looking at Evidence of viral persistence have been in autopsy studies, um, but we, but you know, the hope is that we can get clever enough uh, to find out who has persistent virus, treat them with the antiviral, and make sure that that marker goes away, and and that's what we really need because we don't know what the dose would be, what the duration would be, so everything would be guesses at this point until we get what we call a biomarker of persistent virus. Uh, we also have in recover actually autopsy studies going on to look in the tissue of people who happen to die having had COVID in the past. Not that they die of the post-COVID, but they may die of other causes, but it'll give us a chance to look under the microscope and actually see what's going on in, in say, the immune system, the tissues, or the heart, or the lungs, or the brain, the nerves. Uh, you really... Some of the things, you know, this is the, the way to get to the answer most quickly. 
And, and while you're looking and why these academic networks are looking, patient advocacy groups are also study, starting to collect funds to pay for their own trials, like the patient-led research collaborative. They say they've awarded close to $5 million for research into things like altered T-cell responses or the role of microclots in causing symptoms. Are these kinds of trials helpful and additive to the knowledge base? You know, I think anything that's a highly rigorous trial is, is going to add to the knowledge base. There's so many avenues to pursue, um, and the more people are pursuing them, coming up with evidence that then can be validated. I would say, you know, the key thing in, in doing small trials is that, as I mentioned before, sometimes you see a signal that looks like it's going above the noise, um, but then when you increase the numbers, it goes back in the noise. So you have to do this validation stage to make sure that anything is uh, that pops out of a small study is really going to be replicated. Uh, in MECFS, for instance, there's tons of studies that have been reported, but none really replicated. So that, that's a, that's the point of all these trials. And of course, no, no one trial can answer all these questions. What's causing the symptom? How can we measure what's causing the symptom? What can we do to treat the symptom? And then what can we do to measure to make sure the treatment's working? That's actually the process in a, in a real rational drug design, exactly what you would need to do. You'd have to go through all those processes. But on the same side, because it's an emergency, you know, you want to sometimes take your take a chance, you know, without having, you know, figured out how to connect all those threads just to see if there's something that's easy. Uh, but as I said, the recovery initiative was put together with the idea that this is not going to be easy. Uh, we'd be very happy if someone could figure this out very quickly. Um, and that would be great. Um, but having been involved in the MECFS world for so long, uh, I think this is this is a chance there is a chance that it's not going to be easy. And this type of a study that is totally comprehensive, leaves no stone in turn, is, you know, is something that um, that is what's needed at this point to protect us against four years from now, you know, having our hands up in the air and not having, you know, not having studied things right from the beginning. And an avalanche of these patients who are going to need treatment. Correct. Right. Dr. Korshetz, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, Maggie, thank you for having me. Please follow all of our long COVID reporting on Medscape.com. Thanks again. <laughs>